Okay, I think we're getting close to going live there. I see, oh, I see the seconds cutting down, five, four, three, two, one. Good <laughs> evening, everybody. <laughs> Hi, this is Mac, Hi, Mac McCullough from Willard Library, here with another installment of Peaks into the Past. Uh, today's, today's topic is aviation in Battle Creek. Aviation, aviation, think of it. It's changed the way we see the world, changed the way we see ourselves. And we kind of take it for granted, you know, today something like 6 million people go somewhere on a plane every day. Wow. But uh, <laughs> 1911, this was the new thing. And we're going to we're going to dive into this uh, project today. And I have a great we have a great slideshow for you and great guests. We have the intrepid Kurt Thornton. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> I brought my plane with me. Yes, he brought his plane with him. He'll be playing with his toys all day. And we have our another regular, Emily Powell, the Education Outreach Manager at Kingley Museum. She is, Hello. Fun. She is fun. She is fun. We, yep. just keep, we just can't get enough of her. That's right. And then the world famous, or at least Battle Creek famous realtor, Bruce Phillips, and a former airline employee for North Central Airlines, and he's got some insight on the airport. And our special guest today as well, Liz Newmeyer, who is a writer, so professor, professor Maris at, at Kellogg Community College, and she has some great insights into the early dawn of, of uh, aviation in Battle Creek. So we're going to take you right up to the present, and we'll get our PowerPoint up here. Woo, yay. Woo. I so I just wanted to throw it to Emily first, our, our storyteller extraordinaire, and, and kind of give us some context for why this is an important topic and why we're looking at it tonight. Why is aviation important when looking at history? It's We can think of it certainly as recent history, but humans have been dreaming about flying, right, for thousands of years. Um, and anytime we look at breaking down barriers is when we see progress in human innovation and technology. We can see that with ships and waterways. Certainly the railroad broke barriers. Um, if we're looking at the invention of the automobile and the Highway Act, we're getting people moving things are happening. And that is kind of how cities were able to evolve as well. And so we certainly can't leave out uh, aviation when we're talking about technology and transportation in history. And Battle Creek is such a great epicenter for uh, the story of, of aviation in our country, certainly. But yeah, we're looking at uh, over thousands of years, humans have We've had kites and we've had balloons and gliders and tried to invent wings and we've seen uh, all kinds of fun stuff. But it wasn't really until the late 1800s when we started seeing more in, you know, inroads in, uh, you know, how to power these things and how to yeah. put humans in them. Right. And so uh, really it was what 1903 i think you guys was the right flyer yeah. um and we saw the wright brothers really start to make serious inroads in in the physics of flight so the story goes back thousands of years but 1903 really the start of our story today um yeah. and what that has to do with battle creek yeah, yeah, and one of those right flyers was the first plane that our Battle Creek residents saw. We're going to kick it over to Liz right, Liz Newmeyer right now to kind of get us started. Um, set the stage for us, Liz. Well, basically, once the the first Wright brothers flight in 1903, uh, didn't last very long, but they eventually they managed to like stay in the air for 39 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it inspired a lot of You're other not going people. very far. <laughs> <laughs> but what really, uh, it caught my attention. I was doing something else altogether. I always love it when I find stories by accident. And I was seeing that Battle Creek was having this Independence Day uh, flight demonstration. They called them aeroplanes. This was pretty consistent, aeroplanes. And so this was a big deal. Uh, you notice in the ad there, it's called Homecoming, which had nothing to do with sports. Homecoming was a... <laughs> I wrote a fairly lengthy article about it one time. D different cities just had homecomings as a as a commercial uh, venture. So anyhow, what caught my attention was several boys who were in Battle Creek Central High School, and they wanted to. They watched 
I can't say for sure that they were literally there, but uh, Leonard Bonney came and this was the first flight, a demonstrated flight. Uh, guy, they didn't call them barnstormers then, but in the 20s, barnstorming became a popular phrase. Um, and so this Leonard Bonney came and gave flights. You, you could take a flight with him. Uh, he would do different kinds of uh, area tricks. In fact, this is really, a, for me, I don't even like flying. <laughs> but these boys were so enthusiastic and so much fun that I had to follow their whole story. So you can see here the plane. He was a right aviator. That is, he learned his uh, apprenticeship, whatever you want to call it, with the Wright brothers. So you can see here what this plane looks like. And nothing like we would think of. As kids and not wheels. Well, it does have wheels in the back. But yeah. <laughs> well, what we drove me crazy, they kept talking about pushers and pullers. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? Well, I finally realized that a pusher means that the propeller and the engine is in back of the pilot <laughs> and a puller it's in front, which we're used to thinking of it in front. I, I had to learn all these new terms. Uh, grass cutter, which was a training plane that didn't fly anymore in about 20 feet uh, off the ground. Um, and the boys are gonna, uh, when I get to that story, they're gonna be building grass cutters. So yeah. anyway, you get a good picture here of the, and the clothes, I love looking at the clothes. Oh, do you the see board. their skirts and their dresses? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And the men always wear hats. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My grandpa always wore a hat. Can you imagine how brave it must have been for these early pilots? These early, you said they were high school boys. This was Battle Creek Central, I assume. Yeah, they're 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. Now, there was one girl, they had an actual aeronautics club, and there was one girl, and I've, I've tracked her, her down. She eventually would become a lawyer. Uh, oh, wow. That was the only female that happened to be in the club. There were about 37 boys. Uh, I only learned about four or five of them because they seemed to be the most active. But yeah, I'd be scared to death to go up in this thing. Yeah. I can't imagine that these, like, er, the you know, the early technology on these, <laughs> were they really thinking of safety? I mean, I know they were trying to think they were height <laughs> and they were trying for speed and they were looking at weight and they were looking at like how far we can go. But were they really thinking about safety? Well, they weren't going that fast. I mean, the, the boys. 40 miles an hour maximum. Yeah. yeah. They, I mean, they, they you, you can't fall that far from 20 feet. I mean, now the next guy who comes to Battle Creek does hurt me. He, he crashes his plane. Uh, on purpose because um, the the motor went out and so he had to land in a place where he would hit the least amount of people. Yeah, <laughs> and so he did take quite a spill. But these but, planes are higher than the ones that boys would would be doing the grass cutters. Yeah, even this first plane, it came to town in a box car and was assembled uh -huh. here. And in the testing before they ran, the engine failed. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, they were they, they wanted to survive these things, but they had a high tolerance for risk, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. That, that was a pusher. Yeah, yeah that was a pusher. Uh, most of them that you're going to see for a while will be pushers. This um, you see Bonnie here. And then notice the other fellow's name is Harry Burt. Harry uh, came to Battle Creek and bought the Osgood jewelry store and was on what eventually got called the bank corners. But Harry was so clever that when Post met him, he said, you know, I want to hire you. And he hired him. He became the um, superintendent of the Post factory. He built the whole Post factory. The guy and his son, Robert, would have gotten the honor of being the first um, aviator of Battle Creek, but he couldn't get this gl uh, glider off the ground. <laughs> 19. It's essential. Um, yeah, right, right. And, it's, and it says in the um, Inquirer, they make reference to it being an unsuccessful flight. He tried to jump off some bluff on um, Goatguac Lake. So then he was going to try to do it at St. Mary's Lake, and his parents stopped him. Harry himself, the father, was known as a really crazy driver. Uh, he, he was the first guy to hit 75 miles an hour in Battle Creek with a car. And so I think he thought his kid taking after him, he might – better make him stop, which was a good idea because when Robert got his first Hudson, he immediately crashed it, <laughs> hurt his leg, and uh, which kept him out of World War I as an aviator. Wow. But he went on actually to make mega bucks. When you see the old movies and it says Beltone, 
He's the one that invented Beltone. He was an, oh, wow. none of these people are just excellent engineers. Well, that's what I love about these programs is you find out about so much innovation that came out of Battle Creek during this really vibrant time for, for, you know, progress and advancement. Yeah, I can't keep up. A lot of these people should be in the Battle Creek Central High School Hall of Fame, uh, but it's just like it's, <laughs> you can barely keep up nominating them. There are so many. Yeah. So we have more. So they actually to get this plane off the ground. Uh, yeah. Spectators actually had to push it to get it going down. Yeah, they had to push it to help. Yep. And then and then they're racing. They also had a car race, two of them, to see whether the automobile would win or the plane. You know, the plane won, but not by much each time. They weren't that far ahead. This is out <laughs> in the athletic field, which would be where Highland. For those of you that know where that was, Highland uh, School, yeah. Lakeview. Planet yeah. Hollywood's there now, yeah. For Planet, Planet uh, Fitness is there now. Planet Fitness. Yeah. yeah. And the Salvation Army's on the backside. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. That's what's there now. Hmm. There's just another picture. Give you pause, wondering if you really would want to be in that thing. <laughs> and this is based on the Wright Brothers style. Mm -hmm. Again, more of the same picture. He, yeah. This went on for three and four days. So as I said, notice the headline there. It says you get your full money's worth, and they did. Yeah, and he landed it uh, near the pitcher's mound there. Right, on, right. On the ball field. <laughs> landed what ball the field was that at Highland or out there? This is uh, Highland. Okay. And I imagine that this, this was a perfect location because of the flatness, right, yeah. of the yeah. land. Yeah, Emily, that's a good point because later you'll see that when the fellows – first have start um, wanting an actual airport, they immediately look at farms on the Gogwak Prairie. I mean, it's just, you know, custom made. Yep. Hmm. Perfect. There's Fred and Will, these were the racers. These guys were actual race car drivers. And um, Fred was from Battle Creek and Fred um, sold, uh, he had an auto dealership. Um, you see the one up there, it says Cutting Racer, Clark Carter Automobile Country with Company, which was in Jackson, Michigan. There also was a Jackson car, uh, which at first, because the way the paper said it, I thought they were in one of those. And then you see Lisa's down there, a Buick Racer. Wonder, oh, those look wonderful. Yeah. I yeah. love And I think, you know, actually is in, in researching and reading it, um, the, uh, the pilot credited that he had a tailwind. <laughs> and that's why he was able to beat Fred Alice because they were going 70 miles an hour, as it says yeah. there in the headline. Yeah. Um, but Will Lysol, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing that correctly, actually won the, the other race because uh, Bonnie didn't have that tailwind. Yeah, and then when the other factor you have to keep in mind, it says the prairie road here, which is mostly territorial, although now the prairie runs off of it, uh, the roads were in the best condition, driving <laughs> 70 miles an hour on those roads. I remember a really rutted road, yeah. Yeah. The Camp <laughs> Custer story where they were bragging because now you could drive 25 miles an hour on this particular road. So I mean this is it's dangerous even in the car. Yeah. Going that fast. Well both of these guys were indie drivers and mm -hmm. it was that was dirty yes. at the time as well. Yes. So they're very daring. And this is Beachy, this is next year in August. I'm not sure why they picked August, except maybe he was just available then instead of Independence Day. But this is Beachy's airplane, which is also a right style. Yeah, it's actually, I think it was a, called a pusher plane because the propeller was behind the yeah. pilot. Yeah. Yes. I, they kept talking about pushers and pullers in the, in the newspaper, like you should know what that is. It took me quite a while. Finally, I got a couple books on aviation. <laughs> just read up on it to see what what does this mean i'm i'm envisioning people pushing the plane or pulling it <laughs> years later cessna yeah. came out with a push me pull you it yeah, was see. called an o27 center thrust engine had a prop in the front and a prop in the back and a cab in between yeah they well, used see, to have them out here at the air national guard for a short period of time ah. so we, we called them push me pull you <laughs> push what Push me, pull you. Oh, <laughs> well, you can see here that he's sitting out in the front. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the, I think some of the thought that design might have been if they crashed, the motor would go over the head and not into the back or into the front of the, if it was a front pop mop 
and he was behind the motor, he'd eat the, eat the engine if he crashed. Huh. If it was behind him, it would dislodge and go over the top. So okay. that might have been the reason the Wrights did it the way they did it. But who knows? Well, well you can see here they tested that theory. He tested <laughs> that theory. There's a segue. And there's the crash. There's, there's the, crash. the crash. And he had to he had to pick a place to he knew he was going to have to crash and he worked hard to get away from the crowd. Yeah. Yep, oh, can't. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Illustrating your point. I got a little fancy with the animation there. Oh, part that's, of it. that's okay. <laughs> Real special effects, but he was pretty seriously hurt. I mean, he uh, yes, he was. He he was quite hurt. He uh, broke his shoulder. He mm -hmm. uh, tore all the ligaments in his shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, fuel tank actually pinned him down. Oh, um, and he landed on a farm. Do you know the name of the owner off the top of your head, Liz? I think I have it here somewhere. Well, there were, I, the, I'm thinking of the farms nearby. There was the Foster Farm, would have been the closest farm, or even the Willard Farm. Yeah, that is close by. Actually, William White, I, I did jot it down on the slide. Okay. At least that was one newspaper account. And I think we always have to say that when we take things out of newspaper accounts, I find discrepancies a lot between the different mm -hmm. papers, different yeah. spellings, different facts, um, things like that. Yeah, I always like at least, you know, you like two sources at least to compare. Yeah. So. There's and I'm the, not just showing another. You can see how, looking at the wreck, that how much likely he was that he was injured. Yeah. <laughs> There's some more. Yes, so yeah, but this kind of gets into what I think is kind of the heart of this evening. Uh, these, these three, these three fellas, uh, high school kids. I love these boys. They're my boys. I kept coming across. I was really looking for the home front in World War One, and and the lead up to World War One for Battle Creek. And then I just discovered these kids. Um, Pete Goff, Edgar was his name. Pete was his nickname. Clayton, his um, nickname was Clayt, and Elwood, Sam. Um, they were probably the core. There were two other guys, Rex Brown and... Um, um, DeWitt Parsons, and they they seem to be the most active kids of the bunch. Uh, Pete is actually in the Michigan Aviation Hall of Fame, and throwing in a bid here for KCC, we were the site of the first successful flight in Battle Creek, where the a library is on the KCC. Now, that hill was about 40 to 60 feet taller. I can't totally tell from the geologic maps. <laughs> he took off from there. In the winter, he had skis on the plane, and this was a glider, not it wasn't right. motorized. And he aims it toward where Lila Hospital is eventually, but there's a farm there. He gets airborne and crashes it into the barn, but hey, he was airborne for at least five, six minutes. So we call that the first successful flight. Oh, that was good. Pete went from a glider to flying a jet. He Before he retired, he flew... Uh, wanted to qualify on a jet plane. He helped train helicopter pilots in Vietnam. I wish somebody write a biography of this man, but it needs to be somebody that knows about planes, not me. And he was the first airplane nut. I don't know if he was the first nut because I'd say Robert Burt was a nut too, but he's, he was the first one that was a successful nut. <laughs> that was a quote from the Looking Black column that was written about him in the Inquirer years yeah. later. Yes. And actually, we'll probably get to this, but Pete also had to do with establishing the first airport. Okay, That's now here, right. here you see Sam. Um, and, and Sam, <laughs> just to tell you the story ahead of time, here's the spoiler. Sam and Plate will form WACO, the Weaver Aircraft Company, WACO. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were brilliant boys. They just knew how to do stuff. I mean, they didn't have any engineering degree, actually, Robert Burt's going to have one from Cornell eventually. They had no degree whatsoever. They just learned by the seat of their pants. And um, by working with Curtis, eventually they worked with Curtis Aircraft. Clayton was so good, the Army wouldn't put him in the air. They, they had him fixing planes because he was so, so uh, talented at doing it. Um, but this is their, one of their first crashes. 
<laughs> Actually, they had several. It says here it was their first crash. I don't think so. They crashed a couple before that. But yeah. in Dewitt Parsons' um, um, story, it's hard to keep track between that and the paper, trying to figure out. This was on Myron Young's farm. Um, which you'll see a map in a minute, but you know when you go down Territorial and you see a convenience store called The Hangar, and you think, The Hangar? It's kind of far away from the airport. No, it wasn't. Not then. <laughs> that was the airport the kids used. And, and, all the, all these, himself, yeah. and all these boys worked on this plane together, right? Yeah. So, yeah, the whole club worked on it together. And they went around and hit up the teachers for gas money and parts. And <laughs> you got the plane and parts, and then you had to put it together. In fact, one of the things, you know, I told you that Robert's parents wouldn't let him build another glider. Pete's mother, on the other hand, sewed the, the wings because they were canvas. <laughs> so she sewed the wings for him. I um, mean, had a totally opposite um, uh, reaction of the parents. Uh, but uh, Pete Goff just goes, he established all of the air routes in World War II. Um, I wow. mean, that man, he's just an amazing man. Absolutely amazing. I don't know why he isn't in the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Clayton Bruckner is. Hmm. Clayton Bruckner is up there with Armstrong and Glenn Earhart, Lindbergh. I mean, he's hmm. in the National Aviation Hall of Fame a graduate of Battle Creek Central High School. I don't think most people even know that. No. Oh, so this is, this is back to Pete Goff here. Yeah, that's Pete. That's a high school photo. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, handsome boy, isn't he? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah here's, your, here's your picture. You see the young farm and the wells. There's a number of different farms there off of Territorial. I love this is like kind of the segue into 1924, which was like the important year. I mean, if right. I was to throw out a year, 1924 is certainly a big one for Battle Creek Aviation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because you finally have an actual airport. I mean, what the boys were using was a field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they did say that, and this was um, in the program of the air race meet that ended mm -hmm. up taking place in 1925. Yeah. Um, they said that any means of transportation that has for its fundamental principle a substantial saving of time. Um, so, yeah, being able to save time while we travel is huge, right? Let's invest in that. Um, the chief obstacle to the development um, is the lack of an adequate system of permanent airports. And I love that the folks in Battle Creek at the time uh, knew this. And so they invested a lot of time and people um, and resources into developing, ding, 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 the first municipal airport in the state of Michigan. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't know how old he was at this time, uh, Liz, in, by 1924. I can't do the math in my head that fast. But, I mean, he really... He helped establish the Battle Creek Air Transport Company. Is that what it was called? Air Service Company. Mm -hmm. And he talked, he, he persuaded Duplex Printing to realize that they could fly and get parts for their machines if they flew in a plane. I mean, he, he because we, we didn't have WACO in Battle Creek originally because uh, Clayton and Sam couldn't find anybody who'd fund them. Yeah. So that's why they went to Ohio, uh, where finally Pete at least convinced them we should have an airport. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he was, and he was only in his early 20s. Yeah, and there's the duplex hangar. <laughs> and I believe I, I read that it was, at the time, the first air delivery service in the country. Yep, it was. Yes, yeah. that was in 1928, yep. the mm -hmm. first mail delivery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mail. Came from well, Chicago. Chicago. No, no, this, this, is the, uh, this, uh, Emily, this is the first uh, business that did air freight. They would have That's been moving. Awesome. This was the air mail. This was, he would. Uh, oh, before the air mail. Gotcha. Yeah. This was duplex doing it. Yep. He was, he was mm -hmm. ahead of his time. This was Mr. Uh, Stone who. Oh, gave us, uh, oh Irving. Irving yes. Irving yes. Park and yep. Uh, yep. So this was the first hangar out at the, uh, where now it's Kellogg Airfield. This was on Territorial Road, which Liz mentioned, they call it the Prairie Road back then. That was. There's Goff. And there's Goff on the left. I think this was when he was inaugurated, perhaps in the Michigan Hall of Fame. I'm not sure. But I mean, That's the man is spectacular. Somebody's got to write it. I tried to talk Andrew Layton into it. 
uh, somebody's got to write a biography of him that understands one end of a plane from the other, which is up me. <laughs> on the rights, an F-86. That's what the Air Guard flew out here for years. In the mm -hmm. first year, probably oh. 1954 through 60, 62, and then they got the RB-57s in. Well, Liz says he went from flying a glider in a, one of the early yeah. to doing flying a jet. That's just amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's also, he helped work with um, Link, you know, the Link simulator systems like the one they have over in Portage at the Air Zoo. He helped develop them. I can blame him. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned on, partly on a Link. So here's a segment where we begin looking at uh, Elwood and, and uh, Clayton's uh, exploits. Yeah, Elwood and Clayton wanted to uh, learn more about flying from somebody more professional. So they went to Fenton, Michigan, that was one of the only flying schools in, in Michigan at that time called, I think, the Williams. There's actually a book that talks about the Williams Flying School and they have, and Clayton and Elwood only had so much money. So they flipped a coin to see who could take flying lessons and Elwood won. <laughs> and Clayton contented himself with fixing planes and designing planes. And it, it, he was always busy mechanically doing something. This is from the peon from the uh, Battle Creek Central High School yearbook. They only did this one year. I wish they would have done it other times, but they put the kids, all of the seniors, in with some favorite thing of theirs. And see here, he's in the, I don't know what you call it, the fuselage, yep. the pilot seat. Uh -huh. hmm. So that's his part, and then there's another one of Sam coming up somewhere here. Oh, this is Clayton. This is, yeah. There is, when you're interested in taking a road trip, there is a Waco Museum in Troy, Ohio, and it has a lot of, about Clayton Bruckner. And then Clayton went off, used his money to establish a um, nature center. Yeah. He gave it all back. He said, I made my money in Troy. I'm going to give it all back. He established a hospital. He established a nature center. He had all kinds of scholarships at high school. So he was a, a benefactor like the, the Kellogg's. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah he's, he, beloved, he's beloved there. Yeah, we could have had him here. But, you know, what, what Emily was saying about uh, realizing the need for an airport, uh, at first people didn't realize that planes really had anything uh, useful except entertainment. <laughs> So they missed the boat on that one. Yeah. Uh, Clayton Bruckner also went on to invent the lickety split log splitter. <laughs> it's after he retired. The man couldn't stop. He also invented one of the first uh, sun tanning beds. I mean, that's the guy, right. Yeah. The guy couldn't stop. He just kept, and he was just a mechanic. One time, he when they were doing the nature center, He's listening to the bulldozer that's, and he doesn't like how it sounds. So he stopped the guy, <laughs> took the entire bulldozer apart and rebuild it. And then it worked better. Yeah. <laughs> he, he just had one of those kind of heads. Yeah. Okay. And here's Sam uh, Elwood and he's holding the propeller yeah. uh, in the, in the high school picture. And then the other one, Sam died young. He had rheumatic fever when he was young. It was given. Mm quite often damages your heart. And he died when he was, uh, uh, I think, 26 or 27 years wow. old. That yeah. was quite a loss to Clayton. Yeah, yeah. I, I found this this uh, paper in the Smithsonian from somebody else's effects. And he had written this paper, and then the quote there, aviation, civilization itself, fundamentally, but is but a it's fun money, but an experiment in transportation. But the, the paper just goes on about how aviation would lead to the end of of warfare and and you know tribal conflicts. I mean, he had a really idealistic um, sense of the end of war, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know because it would bind us together and, and make the world smaller. Yeah, they said the same thing about the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Emily, yeah. you know, Emily's point about transportation being on the move. I mean, it, it didn't matter whether you're on a donkey or a covered wagon or whatever. We have always been on the move. So that's that's Sam. And then they are the ones who they the reason it's called Waco is they didn't have enough um, reputation themselves. So they joined with a uh, Buck Weaver, 
who was a barnstormer. They thought his prestige would uh, allow them to get more investors. And so it's a Weaver Aircraft Company, Waco. Oh, Waco. Not Waco. Don't say Waco. <laughs> That's a town oh. down south. <laughs> well, and, and ironically, at one point, they did wind up in Waco, but I don't remember why. But no, it's Waco. Um, and, uh, of course, Waco eventually came back to Michigan and finally to Battle Creek. I'm happy to see it come back here. I'm sure the boys would be happy Absolutely. That, that their aircraft came back here. Yeah, the Waco Cootie. <laughs> and Henry Ford would buy nothing but Waco planes for the Ford company. Huh. And they won a, a, I'm not sure of the year, I think it might have been 1927, they won an air race. And all of a sudden that made Waco planes uh, much more um, desirable and they were very um, reliable. You know, they were a very reliable plane. That's um, important in an airplane. That's really important <laughs> in an airplane, yeah. <laughs> That's expensive though, uh -huh. 1200. Yeah. Yeah. Ford did get into the tri motor later on. They made the Ford tri motor. It went over in the Commons Air Museum. Yeah, all the, all the planes had a number. When you and there are books about Waco, uh, with lots of illustrations of the Waco Ten. Um, yeah, Portage has two of them. The Air Zoo has at least two Wacos, and you can, or at least I think you can. I took a tour of the Waco uh, plant here several years ago, and um, he said at the time they were mostly not building new ones they were refurbishing old ones for people wow that was the, it. the 10 was what really put them over the top that's mm -hmm. what made clayton bruckner his fortune and and mm -hmm. and that was ubiquitous when even when he sold part of the company to supporters he kept 53 percent of the stock smart man and always the owner 53 <laughs> percent was a smart man Yeah, there you go. And, they, and then a lot of them would make their way. There's, here's the uh, Davis and Felix Airways. And now is this the same hangar? Yeah. Look at the back. You see there, Davis and no Davis and Felix. I can't read. I can't read the rest of it. Yes, Davis and yeah, Felix Airway. Yep. That was another couple of guys um, that we don't get into much. No, yeah, I don't know much about them. Like I said, I just tended to center on the young men because they were so crazy. I mean, they kept crashing things all the time. Then they just rebuild them, crash them some more. They would stand on the wings of the plane to try and turn it. <laughs> because of a, a Curtis grass cutter, you couldn't really turn. It was just meant to, to train, you know, to fly. Oh, no, they wanted to do all these other things. Well, here you are. We're, we're getting bigger now. Like Emily said, this is 1925. Transcontinental airplanes. Yeah. Yeah, now you can see where the airport was is yep. in relation to Camp Custer. There were several local sites, but the young farm lost out to the Wells farm. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was just more territory around or what, but it's still the same principle that Emily commented on. It's a prairie. It's a natural mm -hmm. landing field. The um the Battle Creek Chamber of Commerce had mentioned it in their minutes um, from their board of directors, um, November 28, 1923. Um, they had mentioned that there was a motion um, to establish an aviation field. So they were thinking about this 1923, but they needed the property. And right. they did look at, you're right, there was another property. They were looking at um, a field that was, they said that was near to town, Fox Field at Camp Custer, um, but uh, something about getting permission. Um, this was, yeah, the Young Farm, now the site of the Prairie View School. Um, this was in the, the Silver Anniversary Program. Right. Um, but uh, then they had a movement that was started to acquire a field near the center of the city. So they wanted something closer to the city, I guess, was why they went with the Wells Farm instead, according to the Battle Creek Chamber of Commerce minutes. Yeah, the Chamber of Commerce uh, was responsible for getting Camp Custer here, too. I mean, they so they were quite active in... in what they're supposed to be active in, <laughs> yes. expand the economy. So it really was the Chamber of Commerce, um, mm -hmm. together with some Kellogg money, um, they were able to, to really get this up and running. Yeah. 
but they needed a big event to kick things off. Right. And then you had this air race meet. Yes. 1925, which was the grand opening of the airport. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it was, uh, yeah, the 1925 officially dedicated and opened on August 28th yeah. um, at the start of this big air race. How exciting. And, and the airport manager was a uh, Mr. Uh, EA Golf. Mr. Golf. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, there he is. He's back. Uh, that's Pete. Pete is yep, back. Pete. Yep. And they had like ten thousand people come and witness this thing. <clears throat> well, so what? Know, so what is an air race? Basically, what it sounds like. I think you know they would pick. <laughs> different locations and who got there the fastest. That's how Waco got its name because it won one of them only they were flying out of Detroit. They um, had like a number, I can't remember how many, a number of planes show up from all over the state of Michigan. They even had one come out from like uh, Kansas. Um, we only had one pilot from Battle Creek. I believe that was, was that Goss himself? That was doing well, it. Interestingly, at the time when we opened the airport, there wasn't an air airplane at the airport. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, we'll worry about that later. <laughs> you know that they, they will come. Exactly. They will come. Right. It's the thought that counts. <laughs> um, but it was certainly important to getting us on the map. Yeah. TR chimes in that the original deed from the farm is in oh, the airport office. Thank you, TR. That's an, good to know. But they had an aerial parade. They had um, different kinds of races. That this was like a two or three day thing, right? Um, they had yeah. parachute jumpers. They had sky riding. They had um, tours. You could go. You could pay and go up in a plane yep. that would take you around Battle Creek for a few minutes. Um, they had. Uh, it was a big. Big, um, this was kind of the first air show, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was a huge success. It actually made money, which was poured back into the airport. 1200 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 1200 bucks. <laughs> and Matt Peg was very responsive. The uh, article you sent us from the inquiry it said they made 2500 but in this uh, booklet that Emily's quoting, it says 1500 So once again, see, you never know where the facts are on this. And they used the money. <laughs> To uh, build a or get a uh, first continuous beacon in the state of Michigan, and mm -hmm. uh, that's where they used that money to put a beacon at the airport. And we were the first one to have one in the state of Michigan that ran continuously. It was, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's yeah. interesting. Interesting after this like really huge start, hugely successful start, and breaking all kinds of records, national records, because these things were relatively new. Mm -hmm. Then there was kind of like a lull in the airport development. And and there was a lot of concern that we were get, falling behind other cities because everybody was trying to get in on the action. Um, but uh, we were the first municipal airport in the state of Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we were worried about falling behind. But then we we, we rallied, and uh, W. K. Kellogg to the rescue. Yep. And part purchased the airport for the city. Yeah, and I, tell, and I tell the story, which uh, I heard uh, Mr. Blazy, who was the secretary for Dr. Kellogg, came and spoke to the Historical Society back in the 70s, and he was telling us that um, uh, W.K. wasn't sure if the money was worthwhile. He wasn't sure if investing <laughs> money in the airport was a worthwhile thing, and so he would uh, call up his chauffeur and say, I want to go out to the airport and take a look and see what's going on. And the chauffeur was friends with the director of the airport, probably Mr. Golf, and would call out there to the airport and say, okay, WK is on his way out there. So they would get every plane they had out there up in the air. So when <laughs> WK got out there, he would go, oh, okay, they're using the airport. I guess I'll continue investing in this. It's like, so that was what kept it going. Well, apparently, apparently, Kellogg had ridden in a plane. He didn't like it very much. <laughs> He'd ridden a plane in Florida. So he wasn't like really enthusiastic, but he saw the business value. Yep. <laughs> And I love this story. One of the foresights of this, oh. this committee or group who put it together and buying that farm was getting a, a chunk of land large enough yeah. to put on a decent sized runway. Mm -hmm. and, you know, for years, Battle Creek had a 7,000 footer paved. And then a number of years ago, when Joe Schwartz was mayor, they extended it out to 10,000 feet. 
And, and, that, and I think they did that for two reasons. One is to keep the military gear, you know, the air guard. And the other was that we could land, you know, just about any size aircraft flying at that point and still, I think, other than maybe, yeah, the SST was here. So I guess, yeah, we can land it, you know, at Battle Creek. So and that's why whenever the president would come visit uh, Michigan, they'd have to land here to go to Grand Rapids because they couldn't land in Grand Rapids. They'd right. to Battle Creek to land the plane. But in this early stuff about the airport, it talks about the gentlemen that were interested in flying. They were the ones that went out there and pulled the cut down the trees, oh, yeah. took the fences down. They right. showed the grass so there was a, a field to land on. They they worked to make it happen because, uh, like like uh, Bruce said, you had to have a large large enough field that was maintained well enough to land on. Um, so yeah, they were they were uh, ahead of their times trying to think of uh, keeping Battle Creek in the loop. Yeah. It, one of the other things that's really interesting, it, uh, so much sweat equity went into the airport. I mean, one of the reasons that they, you know, they were able to do it is these guys just built it. They, they took out the stumps. They rolled the ground. They, you know, they worked on it themselves. They planted it. They planted yep. the grass out there. Yep. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and they went around to the merchants to collect money to support them. And so you had the fundraisers out there, too, getting enough money for gasoline and everything else that they needed. To yeah. set up the airport. So, so then 20,000 people watch these people get married in the air, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, the airport thought it would be kind of a good good publicity for the airport. And uh, he worked for the airport. Randall Randolph Russell, is that his name? It's hard yeah. to read on the screen here. Yeah. And uh, Elizabeth Nagel. And uh, yeah, <laughs> there's uh, subsequent features about the two of them years later in, in the paper. But. I wonder if he included that detail in his proposal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the first airmail delivery in Battle Creek. This was, uh, and the ah, plane, this was the air delivery. Okay. Uh, the, plane, the plane was called the uh, Miss Kalamazoo was the, uh, uh, the the name on the plane. And so this was the one that came from Chicago then. Yes. Right. And landed here in 1928. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. And there it is. Yep. There it is. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah, the 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 mm -hmm. oh, well, and we had to put this photo in. It's yeah, famous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you found, you found a better picture. You found a better picture. She That's looks sweet. familiar. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not going huh? Amelia Earhart, before she uh, got lost. <laughs> this is so. before. Yeah, yeah we know what happened to her after she got lost. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kellogg took him up in what is it? What was it called? A gyrocopter? The gyrocopter, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Auto gyro. Auto gyro. Oh, there we go. Yep. Uh -huh. That had to be an odd thing to fly. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> no, strange. Uh, this is the first Kellogg hangar, uh, or this is the Kellogg hangar was built in 1929, is what I have down at uh, the Kellogg invested the money, and this was where the uh, airport uh, uh, headquarters was at, and where they uh, they they watched, they might man the airfield from this uh, this location. And there's a sh aerial. Yeah, this is what the 1936. 36, yeah. Uh, when the uh, um, Army Air Corps was doing uh, maneuvers out here, and this. Uh, and it looks like they're building the runway on the uh, right-hand side of the picture. It looks like they're putting a paved runway in. But uh, in the center of the picture is the Kellogg hangar, and Territorial Road runs from the lower right-hand up to the center of the picture. Uh, you can see Gogwak Lake off in the distance, and the uh, cemetery is there uh, right next to the, the, the airport. But, yeah, they were uh, making uh, strides back then. Yeah. This is the same event. This is uh, but showing this is from the ground uh, and showing the, the airplanes out there getting ready to do their maneuvers. And this one I was like, because you get to see the uh, Kellogg Airport. At least they they did put a big sign on the side of the terminal or the uh, hangar, so you knew where you were at when you were there. So. <laughs> There's the beacon. That's the beacon. That's the beacon. And this was sort of odd. I found this picture in Mom's stuff, and it shows them they it was a they they were showing how they could move the tower uh, so many hundred yards or something for, without having to take it down. They actually just moved the tower as it was standing upright. Huh. And this is a night. Well, the nineteen forties. Yep. 
So you can see it expanding already. Got cemeteries in the bottom uh, corner. This is looking uh, northwest over the uh, the airport. So in the 40s is when we started to see uh, commercial uh, airline flight come in, and this this documents the uh, I guess uh, first commerce trip. No, this was actually a visit to another service, right, Kurt? Uh, I'm not really sure on this one. I didn't. This is not one of my pictures. So uh, America did they fly in here with passenger service, and they started it in the 40s and and stopped in the early 50s. Then Lake Central took it, and then North Central after that. And United did for a short period of time. And we had a flagship plane named after us. That's pretty cool. Wow. That is cool. And oddly, that was April 1st, 1940. For April Fool's Day, they came up with this. So, <laughs> 300 mile per hour. Whoa. Jet assisted. Oh, I have a note here that's 1945. The first American airline plane oh. uh, since the war arrives at Kellogg Field, christened the flagship Battle Creek. Oh, okay. Uh, 19, my dates were wrong. 1945. At least that's in the silver anniversary program. Which, speak of the devil. <laughs> no, that's not the silver. That's not the silver, is it? That's no. a DC-3. Yeah. But this was right after the war when when it reemerged. There was a lot of secrecy there at the airport, and well, we were yeah, proud. They didn't want you hanging around. They kept told people to move all the time. They patrolled the borders of the uh, airport and made people move. This is during the war. Yeah, of course, I mean, 19, 1940, oh, 1947, They really they named it Kellogg Field and. Uh, and all the stuff I read, W.K. Kellogg never wanted the stuff named after him. Even no, though he didn't. Oh, people said we well, could have stopped it. I said, well, I guess he could have, but he, 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 didn't, he was not a showy person. That was not his thing. He, uh, but so many things were named after him in tribute to all of these he's given to the community. But, yeah, this was because, once again, uh, like, like Max said, people weren't uh, their municipal airports. This was a big deal, and Kellogg invested his money into the city uh, on a thing he didn't, wasn't even really keen on flying. He, he was willing to see it as a business uh, opportunity. But yeah, it looks like the 40s was purely military use, right? So yep. in 1942 is when it was the entire airport was uh, leased to the U.S. Army. And then yep. that was finally released in 1947 to come back to, you know, commercial use. Yeah, yeah I would imagine a lot of secrecy. Mm-hmm. And there's a piece of equipment from Clark. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the Battle Creek area. Or the forklift, yep. Yeah. An early forklift. Uh huh. Y utility, u utility truck. <laughs> <laughs> and there is the airport in 1950. I don't know why we put the second slide up, but Kurt told me to do it, so I put it. Yeah, up. I, was, yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was cool. Fall, it, Kurt. Yep. It, is, it is cool. Uh huh. No question. There's so, oh, that's Bruce, nice. tell us about these. Well, uh, down on the bottom right is the DC three that is currently in Greenfield Village, hanging up. Uh, it has the equivalent of twenty-five round trips of air miles to the moon. So 25 round trips to the moon air miles on that aircraft. Huh. Uh, our, our, our company owned it and used it as a um, executive flying aircraft. And they kind of put nice things inside and took out the regular seats. And um, for a short period of time, they had what they called a jet assisted takeoff motor in the back in the tail, right below or right in front of that tail wheel that would help get them off short air fields when they were flying around in the Midwest. We served a number of small communities. Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> it you know, was one of them. Pelston, Michigan. Yeah. Uh, there was all kind of small fields. And, and the corporate aircraft, Those, the, the president of the company, Hal Carr, he was chairman of the board, would like to, he always got out at least once a year and flew to every airport that they serviced to make sure that the quality that the standards were being maintained. So that aircraft had a great bit of notoriety and they ended up donating it to the Greenfield Museum. 
Greenville uh, Ford or Henry Ford Museum. Oh. <laughs> the plane up above that is a conveyor made by Conveyor Aircraft Corporation, 440. That was the style of it. It carried 48 passengers, uh, a regular piston prop, uh, two engine aircraft. And then uh, that served the airline for many, many years. And then they prop jets came in, the turbine driven pop, prop jet. And they, that's the plane right above that with that more bluish green paint scheme. And that is a Convair 580. Basically, they took the 440 and retrofitted the motors, extended the nose a little bit, put weather radar in the nose. Uh, but the, the number of seating capacity remained the same. And then eventually, uh, in the 19, let's see, I got there in 68, about 1970, uh, they took delivery of their first DC-9-100 uh, twin-engine jet uh, made by McDonnell Douglas. And I think they got initial delivery was four, and then they took another six later on during the early 70s. And they use those on the longer routes uh, at Chicago, uh, Detroit, uh, Chicago Twin Cities, uh, Detroit, Toronto, um, Minneapolis to Denver. Um, so they in Minneapolis to Omaha, uh, they use that quite a bit on the longer legs. Um, the formation they're flying right there, as you can see, there's quite a bit of space from that. Convair 580 and that DC-9, he's going as slow as stall speed. If you look closely at the wing, the flaps are fully extended on, on, the, on that DC-9 on the top. You can see the shadowing of the, cla of the flap. Yeah. The DC-3 down on the bottom is at full bore. And he's got <laughs> he's he's 440 and the 580 are, are probably at medium speed, cruise speed in order for him to get this picture. But uh, it... <laughs> interesting shot. Yeah. It's such a great picture. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the Convair 580 by itself. Yeah. And nope, I take that back. That's the 440. Ah. It hasn't got the piston engine on it. It's a little different cowling on on the four on the 580 than there is on the 440. But and how long great, were you with reliable. how long were you with North Central Bruce? About six, six and a half years. Uh Started April Fool's Day. 1968. <laughs> 19, it was a big mistake to hide a fool. 1968, April 1st, and then I left in, I uh, don't know the final date, but it was sometime mid October of 74. And, uh, and I enjoyed every day of it. I mean, it was fun. It's just for hard to admit. For a single person at that point in time in my life, it was the greatest opportunity. So, yeah. Did it's a lot just, of traveling. It's just hard to imagine that. Passenger service at the airport, but it, it, that's what it was. Um, and here we we're talking about you know the traffic at the airport, or the slide is about that. And this was in the fifties that they added the jet runway. The what? The the runway for jets. Yeah, that that was for the Air National Guard. Yeah. Yeah, it was a busy place. I flew to Chicago any number of times, sixty eight, sixty nine through I don't know seventy five. On always asked. Did North Central? Yeah, it was a good airline. I, you know, again, I had a lot of great stories. That's the picture I sent you. Right, and yeah, that was taken by Al Schaefer. Took it was flying the aircraft, and then Kermit Crummel and Crum Photographic um, developed the shot and took the shot, and he put it on a four by eight sheet of plywood, or not plywood, a poster board of some kind. It's really neat. It's held up. It's kind of a sepia uh, looking picture. But it shows the main runway. The terminal building is on your lower left corner, um, and it's just under construction. It wasn't finished at that point. And the Air Guard base is over there with the arrow-shaped ramp, and uh, you're looking south. And the long runway at that time was 4 and 2-2, two, two, uh, but the geographical magnetic compass has changed. Now it's 5 and 23. But uh, at, the, that was, at that point, it was, I believe, 7,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And they extended it again, like I said earlier, to 10,000 uh, later on. But it, And they've added another runway since this photo, which is a, a parallel runway to the long one. It runs, um, I can't point to it, but anyway, it runs to the left side. Uh, if you went out the front door of that terminal, um, go 
go down about 200 feet, 200, <laughs> 200 yards. And they built that about, oh, I'd say nine, 10 years ago. And it's, I think it's a 3,500 to 4,000 foot um, paved runway. And it wow. goes out over South Columbia Avenue so, by the movie theater, West Columbia 7. I have to throw a commercial in here for Kellogg Community College, because it was the site of the first successful flight by Pete Goff. But we also now have a, a direct uh, transfer agreement with oh. Western School of Aviation. So the Neat. kids enroll immediately in Western and, uh, and KCC and nice. seamless transition. They had original photos inside that building, inside the mm -hmm. terminal building on the wall. Ah. So the one that I took from the air, the air view that Kerm and uh, Al Schaefer had done. And Kurt, you sent us these photos, and you talked about uh, what was in the terminal, the Kitty Hawk. Yeah, the Kitty Hawk restaurant. Restaurant. Yep. yep. Celebrated my 21st birthday in there. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a restaurant there today, is that right? No, no. not any longer. They moved it out to the Waco. Uh, oh, the Waco. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly That's enough, right. Nancy uh, Schaefer, who worked in the tower as an air traffic controller, owned the restaurant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Dual income coming in. But, hmm. yeah. So the bottom right photo is shows some of the uh, hangars that used to be along um, Helmer Road. Um, it was uh, it, sometimes you'd go down Helmer Road, there'd be like planes being taken right in front of you. You'd have to stop your car while they moved a plane in front of you. They were on both <laughs> sides of the both sides of the road. Yeah, uh, those are all gone now. Yeah, and a big air show in 1962. Mm -hmm. And that's when they bought the Lafayette Escadrille in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and the JCs were real active with that show. Um, There's an excellent book about Fred. Oh, he's Fred. from uh, uh, Zinn. Yeah. Was that Fred Zinn? Yeah, it Fred, is yeah. Fred Zinn. Yeah. 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 He was in World War I. Yeah. Yeah. In World War II, he mostly concentrated on finding lost. Um, pilots. He was, in fact, his methods are still used right. today in Vietnam and other areas right. to find lost pilots. Wow. He was quite a photographer, too, I understand. So. Yes. Now, this is my uh, cousin, uh, Don Tryon, coming back from Vietnam. He's the person in the center of the picture. He uh, later went on to be a fire marshal in Battle Creek. Uh, he passed away last year, but this is him returning from Vietnam uh, at the air terminal out at. Uh, oh, was it John? Don Tryon. Oh, Don, yeah. Yes, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He had a twin brother. And that's, the person on, that's the person on the left, is Ron Tryon. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's the old 440. Yeah. Oh, th thank Why you, Matt. That's, uh, that's me on the uh, left with my mom, Francis Thornton. Uh, I have no idea what we were there for, but someone was coming back from Hawaii, which is a lay. Lay, a lay on. And the person getting off the plane is whoever we were there to see. She has a lay on her uh, around her neck also, but uh, that was, I think it's 62. Well, I think we've managed to get one or both of your parents into every program so far, Kurt. So. And they, well, they were involved in everything, the history they could be involved in. Yes, so, they were. Uh, I haven't seen Junior in any of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he has been in some of them, yes. I don't think we have him today, though, maybe. No, we don't have him in the pictures today, no. I don't know what that is. Can you shed any light on 40s. that? Or? That's not the 50s. I think it's in the 40s. Yeah. I have no idea, but it's out at the airport. It's a cool, it's a cool shot, That's nonetheless. This is, I love this. Is show. this is at the air show. Is that you yeah. playing with a prop, Kurt? No, I, I, I was afraid of airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not have been doing that, no. So this is a continuation of the air show, is that yeah. right? The 62 yeah. air show, yeah. So they're inviting families. I love that this is a continued tradition, like almost since that 1925 air race, right? It's like we were one of like the first places to really showcase the wonders of this technology to the public like come on out and you can like touch you can it and you can it, yeah. uh -huh. look at stuff and you can see I, I love this and so it's just been a continuation of that tradition yeah. that's a navy that's a navy aircraft carrier capable aircraft they land on a carrier they fold the wings up tuck it down underneath who's that guy 
So uh, when President Johnson came to Battle Creek in 1966 to uh, celebrate the sanitarium's 100th uh, birthday. Which was crazy. We should do another program, Mac, on presidential visits because we've certainly we had quite a uh, quite a few yes, we have. over the years, on and the airport the might have something to do with that. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, we're still right the third longest runway in Michigan, right? I believe so. Yep. But for a long time, that was our point of pride. If you wanted to go anywhere other than Detroit, you got to fly into Battle Creek. Battle Creek yep. And now there's another one up in Grand Rapids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these these photos are cool. Yep. I mean, it allowed for a lot back. of opportunities. This is rare when we had two on the ground at the same time. These are some, some slides some friends of mine had. They they loved the airport. And they went out and took a lot of pictures, so they had these slides of the airport. They'll see in the front of the ground power. They had plugged that into the aircraft to keep the air conditioning and the air running. And then it would also give enough on the turbo props. It gave enough air power to get them started with an air air uh, injection. So I got. Can I share the great story about this one? Please real do. Quick, real sure. quick, one of our uh, ground crew were responsible for that unit to be plugged in and unplugged before the aircraft started and went. Was in a hurry one morning. And the plane had overnighted in Battle Creek, so he gets out there in the morning. He gets the guys on the aircraft, the plane's loaded with people, and he gives them the salute to back out and go. So he, the pilot pours the coals to the left motor to turn it out toward the runway. And didn't it, Paul, all of, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned it. He looked, <laughs> and it, oh my God, and he's starting doing this. The pilot didn't see it. The tower saw what was going on, but they didn't know what, what Paul was trying to do. What it did is it pulled that cord so tight it snapped, and the cord dangled from the airplane, <laughs> about 20 feet of it hanging below the air, the wing. Well, the pilot took off, and then he was going to Kalamazoo and then Chicago, or South Bend in Chicago, and he got into Kalamazoo, and on the way, he said, I could hear this thump, thump, and thump, 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 thump. <laughs> he gets over to Kalamazoo, and the guys in Kalamazoo saw it, unplugged it, and they wrapped it up in a great big box and a big bow on it and sent it back to Battle Creek. <laughs> and, <the next> <laughs> night. <laughs> and nobody wanted to own up who did it. <laughs> you know what? Watching these planes, I remember that I grew up in the Bay City uh, area where you have Tri-City Airport. Emily, you were talking about the family thing. It was a big deal for us to get in the car, go over to the airport and watch airplanes land and take yeah. off. I mean, that was great entertainment. Oh, yeah, we used to go to the airport, yep. And, and I'm sure the same thing was true here. This is in the 50s. I mean, there wasn't well, much. Some people had to travel very far to be yeah. able to yeah. witness you know, golf those was kinds of things. Liz, you remember the picture of golf with the jet? That was the type of jet I believe he was sitting in right there. That was sitting yeah. out in front of the Air Guard for years. Oh, oh. Now that's what this is. This is in front of the Air National Guard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Kalamazoo, when did that become uh, like a, a, an airport? Oh, back is at some point, is it an airport? Is it? Oh, is that an airport over there? Or do you want to run the passengers? don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a question I often get: is we were the epicenter, right, for a lot, you know, especially for passenger uh, flights. At what point did that transition to Kalamazoo? In the late '60s, early '70s, there were more people boarding aircraft out of the Kalamazoo air airport than there were out of Battle Creek. And a number of reasons for that was, first, political, because the political uh, consist of Kalamazoo was very progressive, and they drove, they flew to Minneapolis, and they actually wind and dine our management to convince them to make the connecting flights in Chicago more convenient from Kalamazoo than they were from Battle Creek. So they, they would go up there uh, probably twice a year, and convince them that Kalamazoo should be the hub and Battle Creek should be shut down. And so when I, I heard this was going on, I was 1969 or 70, it started in 70. And in 71, I met, I left and went to the Twin Cities and got a promotion. And in 72 or 73, I believe they shut it down and Kalamazoo got the whole kit and caboodle. But it was basically political and scheduling to get the flights to connect better to Chicago than it was from the Battle Creek flights. 
And, and just for a point of, of information for consumers, a one-way ticket from Battle Creek to Detroit when I worked there was eleven dollars and fifty-five cents. Twelve dollars and sixty cents to go to Chicago. And I was making wow. three hundred and eighty-three dollars and fifty cents a month. Wow. I was getting rough. Um, but money was worth a lot more back then, too, right? Uh, yeah. They might perhaps have the airport, yes, but we have still continued the tradition of our of our air shows. We do we have got, our, we our have WMU flight school. We've yeah, got we the have flight school. Man, man, we've got the guard base. We've, we've got, got we've got Waco. We've got Duncan. Duncan Aviation. Yeah, yeah, we got yeah. Waco. All it the was, manufacturing. So, yeah. so this is, uh, when the uh, the terminal, the the uh, hangar that was owned by Edens, uh, burned in 1976. Mm. Uh, this was uh, this was on the uh, east side of Helmer Road. This uh, dad dad and I went out there after the fire, and I believe Bruce said that the young men that uh, started the fire attempted to put it out themselves using their own hose Water and apparatus. Yeah, yeah, using their own hose and apparatus. They were, they were they were trying to bladder it out. And it didn't yeah, work. thank you. Yep, didn't work. No, I think that's where. Galoop Pipe and Supply and Kendall Technologies is located now. They rebuilt on that site. A, a nice new building there. Yep. Huh. Yeah. That was sad to see it go because that was a that was a magnificent big hangar. Yes, it was. Yeah. A lot of tar paper. There was black smoke coming out of that thing. This is actually a picture of it before it burned. It's on the right hand side of this picture. And right. Helmer, Helmer Road is running between those terminals. That's uh, huh. where Helmer Road ran back then. And I don't know who these kids are, but uh, they're not the ones who started the fire. Are they? No, <laughs> no, I don't think so. That's it. We got to find them and serve them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. Um, that that terminal was built in what, 1958, is what I have down. It was. Uh, I think it dedicated 59 or 60. Uh -huh. Yeah, it took a couple of years to get it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so don't pay attention to that date in the lower right hand side then is what you're saying. Well the Next. picture was probably taken in eighty five. That was probably taken in eighty five. Yeah. Battle Creek connected to the world high school trip. Yeah, this was nineteen sixty three. Uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post, uh, who was Marjorie May Montgomery, um, she uh, paid to have uh, a twenty four Battle Creek Central High School students uh, flown to Washington, DC to uh, spend the weekend at her home in Washington. How cool is that? Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> this was shortly after they built uh, CW Post Field at, uh, right. at the high school also. Hmm. So cool. yep. Other photos that I have of Battle Creek that I took, hmm. most of them down in the Battle Creek Regional History Museum on Jackson Street, huh. um, show Battle Creek Central's old football field. So we knew, based on those photos, that it was 1959 and 60. They tore it up. And they dedicated the field in 63 in the fall. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, the high school student council, that was mostly the student council that was flown down to Washington and and, and joined the weekend with Mrs. Post at her mansion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Hill, Hillwood, is that the name of the house? Yeah, something like that. It, was, it had a fancy name, Millwood or Billwood or something. It's not part of the Smithsonian, I think. Uh, they have the art collection there from her, her Russian art because she collected yeah. the Russian art with them. She had a lot of those Russian names. A lot of jewelry. A lot of jewelry. <laughs> so this is not a Kurt Thornton illustration, right? No, no, this is not a drawing. This is a drawing they did of the airport uh, when they were conceiving it. So I was not around them. Okay. At least I wasn't drawing them. And we heard about the Concord earlier. That was in 1998, July. Uh, the Concord landed here in Battle Creek. I, I didn't even know this. I was looking through my mom's picture. I apparently was missing this totally. So uh, she was out there taking pictures. So neat. You know, the date on this is August, what I have on my slide is August 22nd, 1998. Oh, I have July, but I'll Which, go with uh, it's like the Empire back. You know, they have different stories on this. That's right. Well, you know, and I, I came here on August 3rd, 1998, and I missed it. So ah, you're not glad on you, that plane. I'm glad your mom took a picture. No. Gannett didn't fly me out. I don't know why. But, uh. Uh, this is them tearing down the Kellogg hangar uh, in 2010 to do the runway extension that Bruce was talking about. They tore down the original hangar. That's where they used to host the balloon headquarters yep. when they played the World's in 81. Which I think this is what 
these photos document. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, this is 1981. This is the first uh, hot air balloon championship in Battle Creek and world uh, the world championship in 1981. And, and that, so that shows you the hanger in the background. Yeah. The Blue Angels. Uh, yeah. well, Flying over the airport there. They were doing an air show down there then. New tower. Yep. And so we just have, you know, just some photos from the current air shows. And, well, the nice uh, thing, if we get this lousy weather out of the, out of our system, they'll be able to have a good balloon week. You know? Let's hope. Yeah. There's another one of those slow motion shots. This <laughs> guy, that P-51's got a full board. And the jet's going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this is not like is Photoshop do, or right? anything. Like yep. this is an aerial what? trick, right? Yep. This is great. How hard is that for a pilot to execute, Bruce? It, you know? it, it, with the new avionics and these jets, it's probably fairly simple. They just set it at you know above stall speed and set their their wings accordingly. And that plane's got that aircraft. I don't know what. I think the fourteen or sixteen. Anyway, that that thing almost flies itself. The P fifty one, I can tell you right now, the guy's hanging on. <laughs> I guess you just have to know where the camera's at. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. The balloon balloons are always one of my favorite things during the air show. And the balloon championship's a great thing for our city. It has been a really, it's a beautiful thing. The, the balloons are beautiful. It's really, it's really a great uh, a thing for our city to have. This yeah. Is, really glad to see it back this year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it true that, the, is it the world, is it like every four years they have a different city that they? They were. World I don't championships. know what's going on. It was a real bad accident out in Albuquerque earlier this week. They lost five yeah, people. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was a that was a Thunderbird with Tony yep. as Waco. This is oh, Waco. 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 This is Waco. Waco. Yeah. This is the new. This is the new hangar out there, and they have a display of their uh, airplanes in there. It's really very cool. And this is where the restaurant is. Right? Yes, yeah, this is from the restaurant. You can look from the restaurant and see this. The front wall of the restaurant's all glass, so they can open it up, so you can be open to the runway. It's really incredibly cool. Oh. I gotta go check it out. Yep. Yep. Neat. There's more of it. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, going here, the Air Zoo in uh, in Kalamazoo Portage is worth checking out. Yeah, um, Waco, just to add on out there, Kurt. Yeah, that's what this. This is their new uh, building. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the engineering pride of of you know Southwest Michigan, yeah. certainly. I like and and the air zoo did provide some of the photos. So if you didn't notice, they were very helpful. They couldn't provide somebody here tonight, but um, yeah. And then we have this last shot of the airport. Yeah, Yay. True. but having WMU here is really a wonderful thing. They are really incredible out there. That's I mean, well, like Liz talked about with the boys of Battle Creek Central, you know, 100 plus years ago, and we're still training those students today. Yeah. I, I love I love that. We still have very brave pilots, you know, that come through the program here. Um, it's yeah. quite a legacy. To and maintain. they probably don't have to push the planes quite so much as they did back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. Robin Bowen put it. Uh -huh. I've been out here in Des Moines for 10 years. And, you know, and this is one of the reasons we love doing these things. I, I hear from folks from all over the country who just love um, to take this little trip down memory lane. I've, I've talked to. Uh, Look at the picture of her when she was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Mac Willard uh, to promoting this and uh, sponsoring this is really great. This is a fantastic a service. It's really a really great. good service for the community. People love this. I hear lots of comments about people enjoying this. And most people don't catch the things I make up when I talk on this show. They actually don't think <laughs> that as much. I really appreciate that. They, But once again, Willard and you, do, you do a lot of work on this. Oh, and thank you. Going more yes. in your lawn and trying to get the, uh, <laughs> the but, you, know, you, you do a lot of work on this. And I, I really, I really appreciate it. And I think everyone who watches yeah. this really appreciates the work you do. Oh, thank and you. Liz, your research is always excellent. 
Yeah. We have amazing resources in Battle Creek. I mean, we have yeah. Willard Library. We have the Battle Creek Regional History Museum. We've got the Mary Butler Archives. We've got the Historical Society. We've got, I mean, if you love history and you love learning about these stories, I, I imagine Willard Library would love to hear, um, you know, what kind of topics uh, we should jump into in the future as well. There's so many good stories uh, in, in Calhoun County um, and lots of places to go look for answers. Yes, and speaking of giving ideas and, and advice and suggestions, right there is my contact information. You can call me directly or send me an email. It's very cool stuff. And if you've missed any of the episodes that we've done so far, um, you can watch them all. We're compiling them at, uh, on YouTube right now. And uh, just go and there is the plane. We've been waiting for this all night. <laughs> so it's it's always a lot of fun. I appreciate um, all the efforts that you all put in. I mean, you know, Liz, you you came down from the Upper Peninsula and just d dived right into the technology Liz, here. Liz always does a great program. Liz is always awesome. great to talk to. Yeah. Liz is always great to talk to. Yep. Fantastic. Well, and Bruce? I, I, like, I like the stuff. I just have this uh, basic distrust of new technology. <laughs> 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 I mean, I can still handle the microfilm reader. Not, not too many people know how to handle the microfilm reader anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, with, so. assistant, with your assistant helping you, you did really well tonight. Yes, I I have I have to have an assistant. Yes, yeah. thank you, Tr. That's right. Hey, yeah, Max, you're going to get a raise. It'll be an extra zero at the end of your check at the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for for taking part. Um, just going to to those of us who are, or to those of our viewers who are loyal and just wait for it every month. We're going to take a couple of months off. Uh, summertime, you know, people have things to do outside. I got to <laughs> mow my lawn <laughs> two or three times a week. But also, we just want to take a little bit of time and, and plan out a year calendar's worth and uh, get some new guests. So if you have ideas, by all means, send them my way. And just so you know, Mac, I'm going to send you a bunch of pictures of your lawn just because I can't stop taking you lots of pictures. I'll just send you lots of pictures of your lawn. Yeah, okay. you need a boat to do your lawn right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty wet. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thanks a lot again, and uh, we'll see you soon. Um, keep coming back on Monday evenings for uh, Stories at Sundown. We'll continue that through the summer, but uh, we'll bring back uh, Peaks into the Past probably in September. So. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Right. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye.